from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City. I'm Matt Miller. And from our studios in Washington, D.C., I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, PayPal launches a stablecoin, the first borrowed by a large company. We'll talk to the head of the company's blockchain and digital currencies team. Plus, the ongoing legal battle over crypto with the courts splitting over the question of when a digital asset is a security. We'll talk about the issue with Melton Demirs from CoinShares. And Kathy Wood says the SEC may approve multiple spot Bitcoin ETFs. At the same time, we'll talk with Terrence Yang of Swan Bitcoin about where we stand in this race. All right, so all that is ahead, a lot to look forward to. But first, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. And what you will find is, is a pretty much across the board update for digital assets. Bitcoin right now up about 2%. We are trading south of $30,000. We've really been in this 29000 something range for quite some time. Ether, on the other hand, up about 1.5%. And XRP, of course, the token in focus when it comes to that Ripple SEC uh, ruling from several weeks ago, is actually outperforming today up more than 3%. What's interesting, Matt, is to see digital assets performing this way, gaining strength at the same time that the broader market is under pressure with the NASDAQ 100 down about 1.4%. Yeah, I agree. It's very interesting on such a risk off day to see uh, crypto soaring. We do see also, uh, very interestingly, the discount to net asset value, which GBTC trades shrinking. So GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, is getting closer and closer to its net asset value as uh, optimism increases that uh, Bitcoin spot Bitcoin ETF will be approved. So um, I think this chart is one of the most interesting that I've seen uh, in crypto, especially around this issue, which we've been talking so much about. Let's continue to focus on um, uh, on on this here. PayPal has rolled out a stable coin fully backed by U.S. dollar deposits, short term treasuries and similar cash equivalents issued by Paxos Trust. PayPal USD will be gradually available to customers in the U.S., according to the firm. Joining us now for more on this, I'm pleased to say, is PayPal's Senior VP of Blockchain, Crypto, and Digital Currencies, Jose Fernandez de Ponte. Jose, thanks so much for joining us. What do you think about the increasing uh, optimism around, um, I guess, crypto versus regulators? Hello, Matt, and and hello, uh, Kaylee. Uh, Thanks for having us. Uh, well, I am an optimist. I, I would maybe qualify with to say I don't think this is versus uh, regulators. I think it is important that there is clear regulation. And we have seen a increased traction there, not only in the U.S. I think that the progress in, in places like Europe and, and other regions is important. A clear regulation is something that is absolute, that we absolutely need for digital currencies to go mainstream. So super excited to see things moving forward. Well, someone else who was very keyed into the regulation issue and was also excited to see this stablecoin announcement from PayPal specifically is the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry. He said that this announcement is a clear single signal that stablecoins, if issued under a clear regulatory framework, hold promise, clear regulations and robust consumer protections are essential to enabling stablecoins to achieve their full potential. That was the quote from him. He obviously is trying to get a stablecoin measure pushed through the U.S. Congress, but you didn't even wait for that. Jose, you decided to launch this now. So walk me through the thinking and what the long-term goal here is for PayPal. What are you trying to achieve with this? Yeah, Kelly, we are obviously a payments company and we are interested in digital currencies because we do believe that they have the potential to transform uh, the the payment ecosystem. If you look at the primitives of the technology in terms of uh, the cost of transactions, in terms of the settlement time, in terms of uh, the programmability, of the tokens there you just can do things that you couldn't do with traditional uh, payment rails and it's something that is strategic for for us and it's something that we want to be a, a part of we also think that by the way that the revolution will not happen overnight if you look at the volume of stable coins today they run 120 billion or so that are out there today mostly they are using crypto ecosystems and web3 use cases and we think that will continue to be the case for some time with some emergencies in specific verticals, in places like remittances or video games. Uh, It's absolutely strategic for us. We like the primitives. We like the ability to be able to do things that you couldn't do before in in payments. And obviously, it's it's a strategic uh, technology for us. Okay, so let's talk about where you're going to be able to access it. Obviously, you're partnering with Paxos for this. Where is Paxos, in conjunction with PayPal, planning to actually list this? 
As of yesterday, we are live on the on the PayPal wallet, and we are ramping up the product now. Over the next uh, days, more and more users will be able to see that in in their wallets. We are going to be, as we announced yesterday, we are going to be enabling that in in Venmo. We are super excited about the ability that for the first time you will be able to send value from your Venmo wallet to your friend on PayPal as opposed to only Venmo to Venmo or PayPal to PayPal. And over time, we will definitely open that up to external parties. We built the stablecoin to be able to be easily accepted by crypto exchanges and, and the apps and wallets, and we will see more and more of that adoption going forward. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to build this on open protocols and as a ERC-20 token so that it is uh, easier to adopt it in a, in a more open ecosystem. I'm just uh, wondering why you uh, would want to be first. Aren't you worried about other regulation? And, and also, how do you expect to generate revenue from this? So I don't think that we are worried about going first. We have been, uh, we are a regulated financial institution. We have been a regulated financial institution for 25 uh, years, and we take our regulatory relations and structure very, very seriously. We are regulated in multiple uh, geographies. What we are doing here, when we think about the stablecoin, we think of that as, as an extension of the PayPal balance that you have seen over the years. The PayPal balance has existed for more than 20 years. What we are doing now is increasing the value proposition of that uh, PayPal balance and making it useful outside the, the, the PayPal uh, constraints. Let's remember also that there are regulations uh, out there. We think one of the reasons we went to New York is that New York has a very mm. solid and rigorous uh, framework for, for stable coins. And, and we think that is very well suited for the business that we're trying to build. In terms of the interest income that you'll generate from, um, from the, from the uh, uh, stable coin, um, how do you split that with Paxos? Um, who gets how much? Well, the, the, the details of the commercial the relationship with, uh, between Paxos and us, they, they are obviously uh, private. And we do think historically it has been the way in which uh, the stable coins get monetized, the yield on the, on the reserve assets. And, and that will continue to be uh, the case. And it's obviously a, a, an interesting aspect of it. And it's a high margin uh, revenue stream. Over time, again, going back to us as a payments company, we are really interested in driving payment flows here that will also be monetized in a number of ways that are beyond uh, and uh, beyond just strictly the monetization of the reserve. As we're talking about payment and the way money moves through the world and who it potentially moves to, there is a lot of concern where I am here in Washington, Jose, about what stablecoins and crypto can enable in terms of money laundering or other illicit activity. Once the token leaves your network, how can you guarantee that doesn't happen on another platform? So let's go to combination of two different factors there. First, again, our, our history in terms of being able to handle, uh, to, to manage fraud and prevent uh, illegal uh, activity in the network. We have been doing that. We have thousands of, of uh, colleagues in the company who are very well versed in addressing online fraud and being able to identify suspicious behavior. And the other side, again, is, is the regulation. So New York has very strict provisions on what you need to be able to do in terms of KYC and, and AML and we are uh, compliant with, with that, is one of the aspects. If you want to be on the regulated fiat stablecoin uh, space, and we will work with regulators, and we will work with uh, law enforcement. Uh, Jose, I wonder, you know, uh, about the consumer acceptance of this, or consumer demand maybe for it. Because it's expected to make remittances cheaper, you'd expect everybody to gravitate towards it. So what's the take up, Ben? So, uh, the remittances is one of the places where we think that you will see initial uh, uh, retail uh, acceptance. You see that on remittances and a few others, mostly on, on fairly specific verticals. We talked about digital goods. We talk about B2B and cross-border commerce. On the remittance side, one of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're uh, thinking about remittances is that the sender, the person in the U.S. who's sending money back, home is acting on behalf of the receiver. So it's important that the experience for the receiver continues to be very seamless. There are flows and remittances going to different countries now uh, for the more sophisticated users. One of the places where we think we will be differential and where we can add value is that we bring that connectivity to that last mile through the business, the, through the network that we have built over the years. You might remember we have uh, we acquired a few years ago Shum, which was a pioneer in mobile remittances to many countries. And if we can improve 
that last mile, so the receiving PNT in, in country does not need to be concerned about whether this is a stable coin and understand crypto and understand uh, wallets. And they can just do what they did and, and deposit into a bank account or pick up cash. Solving that last mile problem is one of the places that where we can add value and that will drive adoption in the remittance space. All right. PayPal's Jose Fernandez de Ponte, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. We do, though, need to get to some headlines outside of crypto in regard to the Treasury market. $42 billion worth of three-year notes just auctioned off by the U.S. Treasury, sold at a yield of 4.398%. The pre-sale when issued yield was 4.416%, bid to cover of 290. That was the lowest primary dealer award ever at 10.3%. Indirect bidders took down 74%, which is the highest since at least 2003. Direct bidders uh, of 15.7%. You are seeing a bit of a leg lower, a back leg lower in the three-year yield after this at 4.41. The 10-year little change, but it was already down uh, by about seven basis points on the day. And remember, we still have a 10-year and 30-year auction to get through later this week. Another $61 billion in issuance uh, going to be coming down the line. Yeah. But coming up, we'll get back to the crypto conversation, Matt. Terrence Yang from Swan Bitcoin on the Bitcoin ETF timeline and a growing number of investigations into the DCG. Also, Melton Demirs joins us on crypto regulation as more traditional investors embrace blockchain te technology. They take in, Kaylee, the orange pill. And of course, to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. the SEC, if it's going to approve a Bitcoin ETF, will approve more than one uh, at, at, at once. Uh, so then, uh, again, because most of these essentially will be the same, and it will come down to marketing. That was Kathy Wood yesterday feeling bullish about the Bitcoin ETF applications. Let's bring in Swan Bitcoin Managing Director Terrence Yang to talk a little bit more about that and all things crypto. Terrence, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. What do you think about um, the possibility of the SEC uh, kind of folding, I guess, and allowing a spot Bitcoin ETF? Uh, great to see you again, Matt. I'm not sure I would characterize it as the SEC folding so much as there are things happening now in the world where wash trading is being dealt with by uh, the authorities. So if you look at what China is doing with respect to Hobie and with respect to what um, the BlackRock, Invesco, Fidelity, and many others are doing using Coinbase as a pricing source, for the surveillance sharing agreements. I think that they, um, they're they helping, they're at a point where crypto is getting cleaned up. So the price manipulation and wash trading that has been allegedly been happening uh, to a rather wide extent in Bitcoin is subsiding. The professionals are coming in. I'm super bullish on Bitcoin long-term as soon as these are approved, but I'm not sure I'm as optimistic as Kathy or some of the others, like you guys had an article on BlackRock and Invesco Insiders talking about spot US spot Bitcoin ETFs being approved within four to six months. I think it might take longer. All right, so, but you think it's gonna happen. And Terrence, what I'm wondering is, do you think that the at least partial loss for the SEC uh, versus Ripple marked a little bit of a turning point in terms of uh, the uh, in terms of the Gary Gensler's attitude towards crypto because previously it seemed like he wanted to crush anything and everything even related to cryptocurrencies and now it seems like the courts aren't going to allow that and they're going to have to in some ways allow things. So there's some element of that. I'm not sure how much. Number one. Number two. Judge Rakoff, who is a better known judge, frankly, for uh, financial kind of services and finance related uh, cases, he basically called out Judge Torres as being 
incorrect in saying that secondary sales to U.S. retail of mm -hmm. XRP is not a security. He didn't say that directly, but kind of implied that that line of thinking was not really correct. So we'll see what happens. And this could end up where the Second Circuit, which is the appellate court right. for both judges, uh, they decide ultimately what's correct and not correct. I would say that Judge Rakoff's interpretation is down the middle for uh, judges and case law. If you look at Howie, the Howie test and all the cases that came after that. OK, so whether it is on this specific issue, whether or not the SEC has actually gotten knocked down a peg in terms of what it is able to call a security and what it is not, or it's this question around the spot Bitcoin ETF, Terrence, I just wonder how much is baked into the market at this point. If those things that in theory would be good news are already priced in and we're at risk of downside, or if it's more risk of upside, should we see approval of an ETF, for example? Sure. So, um as soon as it's approved, which could be as long as uh, several months to up to two years, I would say, um, on the on the outlier, um, maybe 18 months, four to six months feels aggressive, but Bitcoin is severely underpriced given its asymmetric upside and given the rush of cash that's gonna flood in to BlackRock, Fidelity, Invesco, and all the other spot Bitcoin ETFs that doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't crash in the shorter term because of all that's happening with respect to Binance and Coinbase and uh, Terra and Hobi. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things happening and it's very hard to predict, as usual, the price of Bitcoin short term. Bitcoin is one of those assets, for better or worse, that's highly volatile in the short term, but long term its trajectory is unparalleled because it's sensor resistant, confiscation resistant, and has a credibly immutable fixed supply of 21 million Bitcoins. All right, Terrence, we have to leave it on that note, but thank you very much for joining us today. That's Terrence Yang of Swan Bitcoin. We appreciate your time. And coming up, we have more conversations ahead. Melton Demirs on institutional adoption and more on regulatory hurdles for the industry. This is Bloomberg. the SEC probably appeals. I think it was a huge victory. And it's a victory mostly in that, forget who was right or who was wrong. Gary Gensler at the SEC has been saying over and over, the rules are clear, just follow the rules. And we had a federal judge that said, the rules are nothing close to clear. But our, our stance, Mike Novogratz's galaxies and the whole industry stance has been, help us get clear rules, because they're not clear. That was Galaxy Digital CEO Mike Novogratz speaking with Carlisle Group's David Rubenstein. You can catch that full interview on Bloomberg Wealth tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time. But as we just discussed, more traditional financial firms are adopting crypto tools. But the uncertainty remains after one judge contradicted the Ripple ruling from a few weeks ago about labeling digital tokens security. So let's bring in CoinShares head of strategy, Meltem Demirs, for more. Meltem, we were just speaking with Terrence Yang of Swan Bitcoin about this. He was saying that he isn't as optimistic about a spot ETF approval as some of the market seems to be. Also was pointing to this kind of discrepancy in these two rulings. So what's your read really on the progress that has actually been made here? I think that we continue to be locked in a pattern that, frankly, we've been locked in since the start of regulation of, of crypto or attempts to regulate crypto, which is we see one position from the SEC, which is regulation by enforcement. Nowhere has it really been established what assets are considered securities and which are not. And even in the two Ripple rulings we've seen, which were not even a month apart, we have dramatically different interpretations. And again, the conclusion we come to, and I think in that clip you just showed um, from Mike Novogratz, he says the exact same thing. The only way that we get clarity is not through these piecemeal regulation by enforcement steps we've seen, but through clear regulatory guidance 
And that, in my view, at this stage, can only come from Congress. Now, you're in the swamp. You know we're coming up on shutdown. We're coming up on an election year. Yeah. There are a number of bills on the floor in Congress that are bipartisan in nature, but the clock is really running out in terms of timeline to get these things through the process. What, uh, how should the community react, or, or how should the community act, I guess, if we don't get clear and concise regulation from Congress? Because that seems like a really big ask, Meltem. It is a big ask. It has been a big ask. It continues to be a big ask. I think there are two important things to keep in mind here. Number one, um, crypto has gone from being a small aligned community to being a global industry with different perspectives. And frankly, companies and projects in the space might have somewhat different goals. Um, as a result, we've seen a number of different PACs and different trade associations forming, attempting to gather resources to use their collective power to lobby and to deploy capital to getting candidates elected that are going to take action that share their perspectives, maybe on the direction that regulation and policy needs to go. So I think crypto mm -hmm. is becoming a political powerhouse. It is an important part of the DC ecosystem. System. And I think in this cycle, we'll continue to see a lot of campaign contributions going from players mm. in the crypto space, crypto specific packs to specific candidates. And number two, I think at a certain point, right, we cannot continue this stalemate. At the end of the day, this is an important geopolitical issue as well. We see strides being made in other parts of the world that do have clear guidance. We see economic activity flowing there. So at some point, I do think this becomes a matter of national interest, a matter of economic economic interest to ensure that America remains competitive. Melton, we only have about a minute left, but you just mentioned the stalemate in terms of policy. It also feels like we're at a little bit of a stalemate in terms of actual activity in crypto markets. What are you seeing? Apathy. Apathy, we're trading sideways. At the end of the day, what we look at at CoinShares is flows. If we look at flows into crypto products that are publicly listed and publicly traded this year, um, as of about two weeks ago, we saw about $750 million of inflows on the year. Over the last two weeks, we've seen outflows as a result of investors taking profit. Mm. And really, we're still very much in a risk-off environment. At the end of the day, the story is all about flows. You have to look at the data. You have to look at the numbers. And right now, the flows are telling the story that investors are taking risk off the table. We're looking to see what's going to happen in the next FOMC meeting and what the macro environment looks like ahead. And I think only yeah. then will we see more flows. All right. Apathy, the word of the day. Thank you so much, CoinShares Meltem Demirs. Appreciate you joining us. And coming up next week, we'll be speaking to the Bit Digital CEO, Sam Tabar. So don't miss that Tuesday, 1 p.m., right here on Bloomberg.